Quote, We knew the world would not be the same. A few people laughed, a few people cried. Most people were silent. End quote. What you are about to witness is the story of one of the people credited with being the father of the atomic bomb for their role in the Manhattan Project, which eventually led to the devastation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Welcome to Science Saturdays, an all-new podcast series that dives into an awe-inspiring lives of researchers whose scientific contributions broke all barriers and transformed how we understand the universe. My name is Shwamajit and in this episode, I will give you a sneak peek into the life of the revered American theoretical physicist, J. Robert Oppenheimer. In the first segment of the podcast, we will discover a few instances from Robert's early life that shaped his scientific career and personality. Robert was born on April 22, 1904, in New York City to Julius Oppenheimer, a German immigrant and one of the wealthiest people in the business of clothing. As a kid, he often used to visit his grandparents in Germany, and on one of these visits, he was gifted with shiny stones that looked like diamonds. Young Robert developed a fascination for these stones and proceeded to collect and study any other shiny minerals. He often reported his observations and sent those to famous geologists of that era, which led him to become a member of the New York Mineralogy Club at the early age of 12. It was all going well for Robert before he went through a tragic incident at a very young age, which allegedly affected his personality. Robert was an introvert, and to make him more talkative and outgoing, his father Julius sent him to a summer camp, where he stuck to reading his favorite books by Chekhov, Catherine Mansfield, and T.S. Eliot. However, the days got worse as the camp progressed. Robert was constantly bullied and teased by the other kids, which prompted him to write a letter to his father complaining about the other kids' behavior. His father immediately met the summer camp director, which led to the other kids being put in line for their behavior. Upon finding out that Robert had complained about them, the kids physically abused him. Blaming his father for sending him to the camp, he kept his mouth shut about the abuse, and it is believed that after these incidents, he developed the Oedipal Complex, a term used by the famous neurologist Sigmund Freud. It must have been hard for anyone to suffer this trauma at such a young age. In the next segment, we begin to explore how this young kid from New York became one of the world's finest theoretical physicists. Robert completed the third and fourth grades in a single year and skipped half of his eighth grade at the Ethical Cultural Society school in New York. During his final year, Robert developed an interest in chemical sciences and upon graduation, he entered Harvard at the age of 18. Although he joined as a chemistry major, his interest soon shifted to experimental physics post attending a course on thermodynamics taught by the yet to be Nobel laureate Percy Bridgman. After graduating from Harvard with a summa cum laude in three years, Robert was informed of his acceptance at the Christ's College, Cambridge. With a recommendation letter from Bridgman, Robert wrote to Ernest Rutherford requesting permission to work at the Cavendish Laboratory. Although in this letter, Bridgman conceded that Oppenheimer's clumsiness in the laboratory made it apparent his forte was not experimental but rather theoretical physics, Ernst Rutherford was not impressed. Robert decided to go to Cambridge in the hopes of landing another offer and ultimately he was accepted by J.J. Thompson in 1924. 
It was around this period that Robert's negativity increased because of all his friends had found life partners. The intensity of his negativity can be judged from the fact that he tried to poison his tutor Patrick Blackett with an apple. After this incident, he was diagnosed with dementia precox, also known as schizophrenia. As Robert had a fascination with the world of books, he took to reading French novel titled In Search of Lost Time. This novel played a role of a psychiatrist in his life. In 1926, he left Cambridge and joined the University of Gottingen where he read Schrodinger's work on wave mechanics and Heisenberg's work on matrix mechanics. It was here that he published his first research paper on continuum spectrum and studied its problems. Robert had finally found something he loved working on and there was no looking back after this. Under the guidance of his research supervisor Max Born, he published most of his remarkable works. The research paper on the quantum theory of molecules established the famous Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which remains to be his most cited work till today. In the mathematical treatment of molecules, this approximation separates the nuclear motion from the electronic motion and thus simplifies the calculations. Following his advances in research, Oppenheimer was awarded a United States National Research Council Fellowship, which provided him with an opportunity to collaborate with Linus Pauling at Caltech. There, they planned to work on the nature of chemical bonds, a field in which Pauling was a pioneer, with Oppenheimer supplying the mathematics and Pauling interpreting the results. However, this collaboration ended when Pauling suspected Oppenheimer of coming too close to his wife Eva Helen Pauling. In 1928, Oppenheimer visited Paul Ehrenfest Institute at the University of Leiden and later continued to the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich to work with Wolfgang Pauli on quantum mechanics and the continuous spectrum. On returning to the United States, Oppenheimer accepted an associate professorship from University of California, Berkeley. His students and colleagues at Berkeley were mesmerized by him and saw him as an aloof and impressive genius. I end this segment by mentioning that he further worked closely with Nobel Prize winning physicist Ernest O. Lawrence and his cyclotron pioneers and helped them understand the data that their machines were producing at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. In the next segment, we shall briefly overview the contributions of Robert Oppenheimer to physics. Oppenheimer's well-known research works were in theoretical astronomy, nuclear physics, spectroscopy and quantum field theory, including its extension to quantum electrodynamics. The former mathematics of relativistic quantum mechanics also attracted his attention although he doubted its validity. His work predicted many later discoveries such as the neutron, meson and neutron star. As early as 1930, Oppenheimer wrote a paper that essentially predicted the existence of a positron. He also made significant contributions to cosmic ray shower street theory and started work that eventually led to descriptions of quantum tunneling. In 1931, he co-wrote a paper on the relativistic theory of the photoelectric effect with a student Harvey Hall. Subsequently, one of his doctoral studies, Willis Lamb, discovered the Lamb shift for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1955. In the late 1930s, Oppenheimer became interested in astrophysics. After the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, his most notable contributions include the tolman oppenheimer volkov and his paper on on continued gravitational attraction which predicted the existence of black holes. Oppenheimer's papers were considered difficult to understand even by the standards of the abstract topics he was an expert in. 
He was fond of using elegant and highly complex mathematical techniques to demonstrate physical principles. His diverse interests sometimes interrupted his focus on science. He read the original Sanskrit version of the Bhagavad Gita and later cited it as one of the books that shaped his life's philosophy. Bringing this segment to a close, you must be shocked to know that he was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Physics three times, but never won. In the next and final segment, we begin to discuss his role in the Manhattan Project and how he came to be known as one of the fathers of the nuclear bomb. On October 9, 1941, the then President of the United States of America, Franklin D. Roosevelt, approved a crash program to develop an atomic bomb. In May 1942, National Defense Research Committee invited Oppenheimer to take over work on fast neutron calculations, a task that Oppenheimer threw himself into with full vigor. In June 1942, the U.S. Army established the Manhattan Project to handle its part in the atom bomb project and began transferring responsibility from the Office of Scientific Research and Development to the military. Oppenheimer was selected to head the project's secret weapons laboratory. This was a choice that surprised many because Oppenheimer had left-wing political views and no record as a leader of large projects. People were surprised to see a nature lover being engrossed in the discovery of an atom bomb. Around the same time, the USA came to know that Heisenberg was appointed as head of the Berlin Nuclear Research Institute. Knowing well enough that only Heisenberg had the ability and mind to create the bomb in Germany, the USA decided to assassinate Heisenberg during his talk in Switzerland if he uttered anything about the atomic bomb. Oppenheimer was entirely against this idea. And to his relief, Heisenberg didn't say anything about the bomb in Switzerland. In December 1943, Niels Bohr, another well-renowned physicist, joined the Los Alamos laboratory. This laboratory, also known as Project Y, was a secret laboratory established by the Manhattan Project to design and build the first atomic bomb. Knowing well enough how dangerous this bomb could be, he too did not believe in using an atomic bomb to win a war. On July 6, 1945, the atom bomb designed by the scientist at Manhattan Project was tested and it detonated with the play of multicolored flames. Oppenheimer exclaimed a quote from Bhagavad Gita, quote, Now I have become death the destroyer of worlds." End quote. The bomb was later used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, in which around 3 lakh people died and tons became paralyzed. Oppenheimer felt guilty because the USA had promised Robert Wilson, one of the prominent scientists behind the Manhattan Project, that the bomb will never be used in war. The devastating sights left Oppenheimer in a dilemma when people congratulated him for his hard work in making the atom bomb, whether to smile or to cry. I end this segment by quoting him again. We knew the world would not be the same. A few people laughed, a few people cried, but most people were silent. We thank you for stopping by and sticking till the end of the story. If you found this podcast interesting and want us to continue making these, please show your support by liking the video, subscribing to the YouTube channel of Utkal Digital Classes and telling us your views in the comments section. We hope to be with you in the next episode of Science Saturdays, where we discuss Rosalind Franklin's life and witness one of the scientific community's biggest controversies. <laughs>